Good morning, and welcome to another week of Journey with Christ. I'm your host, Mark Mitchell, a preaching minister at the Park Avenue Church of Christ here in Charleston, West Virginia. And I'm joined, as always, by Steve Fox, a minister for a really long time. Long, long time. How you doing today, buddy? I'm doing okay. Every time you mention that about how long I've preached here in the Valley, uh, Susie and I got married in 69, and, and we moved here in 71. Uh-huh. And I had grown up in Cleveland, and Cleveland and Charleston were culture shock to me. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I, I told my dad on the phone, I said, I'll be home in a year. And we lived the same place out there for 21 years. Yeah. So, uh... Well, it kind of... Charleston kind of grows on you. Well, actually... West Virginia kind of grows on you. There are a lot of people who move away, but it's amazing how many people at some point in time come back because it's like, okay, this place is different. Elk, Elk River became our home. Yeah. I mean, the schools and the people. And it was it was really good. It was really good to have those 20 years up there. But then we moved in town and we're working on, I don't know, 26 or 27. I, I don't keep track of it like you keep track of it. So. Yeah. I, I don't keep track of it. Um, so, but anyway. I think I, I think one of these sessions, you ought to let me introduce both sure. of us. And, and I'll say, and Mark Mitchell, who's preached here for almost 12 minutes. <laughs> In comparison to, to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, that would be true. That would be true. <laughs> Well, Maybe, you, or you, you know, might say, hey, we're still waiting for me. <laughs> well, you, you know why you got this job. I've told you that before. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Half the church wanted to hire a preacher, and half the church didn't want a preacher, so you were the, the closest, closest thing. thing to no preacher that they could find. <laughs> Or maybe that was me. That was uh, one of us. Could have been both. If you would like to turn your Bibles yes. to Luke chapter 12, we are going to study today in our series on the parables. Uh, the parable of the rich fool, Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. And I'm going to begin reading there. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be in your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how, we, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but who is not rich toward God. Uh, this is not a popular sermon among uh, Christians today. <laughs> no, it's not. And well, and it's not a popular parable or story that anybody who lives in our version of Americanized culture today, because um, but big you, barns is that's that's the end. Yeah, and. One of the things that you can see from this parable is, and you and I note this all the time, we both know people who would give up everything they had yes. to, be, to be a part of that discipleship movement, to say, I want to be a disciple of Christ. And we know people who are, let me say, crazy enough that they would do that, or devout enough that they would do that. Yep. And, and, but Jesus is saying this, this guy is holding on to his possessions with with a grip that you cannot, you know, he couldn't let go. He just could not let go. It's, uh, if you take into consideration and you keep the parable of the talents and this parable in context, uh, the parable of the talents, those men took what God had given them and used it 
but never looked at it as it was theirs. Okay, they knew they were going to have to give it back. Yep. This man has just been given an increase in his harvest, you know. And what does he want to do with it? He wants to hoard it. Did you notice that when you read that, that the, in the first in the introduction to the parable, as Luke writes, someone in the crowd said to him. Remember yeah. a couple other parables we had. A lawyer says to him. Yes. But you know you hear you hear people talk all about. Well, when's he going to have a press conference? When's he going to answer some questions? Well, here you got people shouting from the crowd questions, and he, well, this was not have, a question. This was a hey, I. Hey, teacher, rabbi, lawyer, I need help. I got a brother. He won't share. Well, yeah, what I meant by that was if uh, if somebody just yelling the questions from the crowd, there probably just wasn't one. There were probably, no. Yeah, you're you know, right. That, that's the way we see our presidential conferences or, or when the president comes out. He, he may want to answer two or three questions, but then, okay, I'm done. I'm yeah. done with this. Jesus never did that. No, he he took time to answer questions all the time. Well, and and you, uh, his, it said many times that you know the crowds were were more than he could handle at times, and he would have to go off and he'd go, go across off the to lake, go walk across the lake, not around it, across the lake. <laughs> And then, uh, then he would also go to the garden many times, and he, he would have his disciples, "Hey, you stay back here," which I, I assume was they were to stay there so that in case somebody did come, you know, hey, he wants to be alone. Um, Jesus, it's awful to be lonely, but man, sometimes you need that time where just nobody but you and God. I, I, I don't. Sometimes just you. <laughs> yeah, I've never been one who. I, I can get lonely, but I'm one of those uh, introverts who can be an extrovert when needed, mm -hmm. but I'm more comfortable as an introvert. I think there's a candy bar like that. Yeah. Sometimes Twix. you feel like a no, nut, sometimes, sometimes you, you don't. don't. Yeah. Well, I was going to go left side, right side of the Twix, <laughs> you know. Uh, but we all deal with things, and this... Jesus is dealing with a crowd whose concept, again, I, from the one thing that I'm really beginning to appreciate about reading the book of Luke is Luke is sort of like saying, these people are a mess. The story, I mean, him being a physician, he's paying attention to not just the uh, physical condition, but the heart soul and mind condition of the community that he's that he's looking at and without a doubt they have lost sight of the idyllic life the kingdom of God life that Jesus is uh, trying to get them to recognize and they're not seeing it. Well, at least this, this one guy's trying to, try, like you said, he's trying to see it because he thinks he's getting cheated. Yeah. He thinks, you know, and, and how many times did he and his brother argue back and forth, back and forth about, well, wait a minute, you, you know, you got $1,050, I got $1,045. That's not, that's not fair. And if somebody, you know, if somebody taught you as you were growing up that life was all the time fair, you had a poor teacher. Well, Mom learned real quick. Uh, she didn't divide things. <laughs> the rule went like this. One cut, the other one picked. Yeah. You get to cut that in half and I get first choice. <laughs> but you think to yourself, are we born with that thing inside of us that, you know, hey, you ain't cheating me, you know. Um, well, if you don't think that's true, go to a nursing, go to a uh, child care center and watch two-year-olds. Watch two years over. Mine, mine, mine. Two-year-olds don't go. Here, I have three of these. Would you like to have one? one? <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. That's something we have to learn. That's learned behavior. That's a, it, and without a doubt, we are. Uh, and can you imagine this guy? 
<laughs> I could see that his friend <coughs> here is probably this is this guy. He's one of those guys that uh, every time someone saw him coming, they walked to the other side of the street because I don't want to get in this discussion over him and his brother again. Can you believe this? <laughs> Uh, Jesus was probably not the first person he asked to do. No, to I guarantee it. you, no. he wasn't. Because if you would, if you would come to Jesus and this was your question or your statement, will you help me get me half what's mine? Well, there's another, in, I think, an inside comment that you could make that's not in the text. He at least gave Jesus the credit that if you take on this, you know, if you become the you judge, you can fix it. You can fix it. You have the authority to fix this, where I've talked to all these other people and they, they don't care. Yeah. Well, maybe this other, his brother had mentioned the fact that he thought a lot of Jesus. Yeah. And maybe that's the reason he showed up to Jesus to say, hey, this is the only guy I can get to give me what I want. And if you've ever thought this was a made-up story or it couldn't actually happen, you can't, this stuff, I've been to funerals where people at the funeral or before the funeral argued about who was going to get grandma's couch and who was going to get the car. They were racing to the cars when the funeral was over so they could get to the property so that now there was nobody there to yeah. to behave in front of. There's an old, old story about the, the lady that her husband died. And you could you could have, I think it was 12, the, the newspaper guy told her you could have 12 letters in, in your classified ad in a newspaper. And you know, she told him, well, put good, great father, great husband, uh, great humanitarian. And the guy said, uh, the guy on the phone said, well, you have four more words. And she said, okay, uh, pool table for sale. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when people start dying, there are other people that have to make choices about what, what are we going to do with that? What are we going to do with the things that are in the house? And now I'm going to say something here that's going to make people probably mad at me, but that's okay. It wouldn't be the first time. I read this, and I, I see one thing. I see, and, it, and if our audience or people in our audience have one of these, I don't care. I apologize before for even bringing it up. You're driving down the interstate or down major roads today in our age, and you see those storage bins everywhere. Mm -hmm. They are everywhere. They can't, but you have so much stuff. They can't build them up. They can't build them that fast. And what that says about our society is, I got so much stuff in my life that I need to go a couple miles down the road and rent someplace so I can put more of my stuff in there so I can put more of my junk in the house. That's right. And so I can empty my closet and go get some more. Oh my gosh. And, and you know, sometimes I open my closet and I feel that way too. I got too many shirts and too many pairs of shoes. And I had the same feeling just the, the other morning. I looked in there and I was like, man, you know, you need to get rid of this half this stuff because half of you have worn over a year. Uh, so Supposedly yeah. that's a rule if you haven't worn it for over, over, a, year, over a year. Give, give it away. Give it away. Yeah. Um, and so he believed with all his heart this guy that Jesus could fix this Jesus is going to say it's 50-50 we're going to cut it down the middle you'll get half your brother will get half mm -hmm. and then he said well who appointed me as a judge he's, I guess he's kind of throwing this back into the lap of the guy who asked the question because he's Jesus could have been the judge. He could have very well said, this is the way you ought to do it. This is the way, this is the fair way to do it. But Jesus said, well, who appointed me a judge? Or an arbiter. An arbiter, yeah. Is that, is that like a lawyer? Yep. Okay. Well, actually, it's just someone you go to to uh, mediate uh, differences between people. But there's a very to me a very uh, important point in truth what is Jesus a king he's a king and he's kind of like taking a demotion here to become a judge and arbiter and he the man doesn't get who he's talking to <laughs> he has no clue that'd be like going up to you know 
Me. Well, it'd be like going up to the president and say, okay, I need you to settle something here. Yeah. And the says, I'm not a judge. I'm the president. You know the difference? Mm -hmm. Go see a judge. Yeah. Jesus probably is saying, Go see a judge. Who who told you that I could... Yeah. I had any authority here. Um, not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Man, if we, we should make a poster and put that on every wall. Your life does not consist of possessions you own. Abundance of possessions. <clears throat> the you abundance of possessions. Life does not consist of well, I got the 20 of pairs of running shoes that I haven't worn, and I'm going to go buy five more. Well, we're not going to get into discussions of fishing lures and fishing tackle right Oh, now. I think that's where we're going next. <laughs> <laughs> that fishing does not make you happy. No. Nope. Buying a boat doesn't make, make you, you happy. happy. Yeah, i got to be real careful here because I was downstairs just a minute ago. There were four of us talking, and I was the only one that did own a boat. Yeah, you're the only so, one. I, I really think Jesus hasn't, well, of course he has an understanding of this. He understands the mentality of the human race. The more stuff I get, the more money I have, the more possessions I have, that's what my life consists of. And if I got a bump, I saw a bumper sticker one time that said, uh, the guy who leaves the earth with the most stuff, most toys, wins. Wins. No, no. And, and you know, it, it's amazing to me even how Christians oh. don't understand that concept. Uh, it, uh, it is one of the areas that without a doubt will, uh, as Jesus pointed, you can't serve God and money. And uh, so in other words, stuff, because you can replace money with stuff, because that's what it's for. But, um, yeah, if we're at Without a doubt, we're at epidemic stages with this because you and I grew up in a period of time where uh, one car was plenty. Oh, yeah. Uh, and a lot of people didn't one have TV one car. was a big deal. Yeah. And time, I mean, we spent time, I remember growing up, we only went in and watched TV when one of our favorite programs. You know what we were doing the rest of the time? We were out on a porch. We were working or we were playing a game. We were spending time with one another. Today we are enjoying our possessions and doing everything we can to get more. Yep. And, and for all of us, Christian or non-Christian, there's a, there's a sensibility about this whole idea that if I do get something brand new, that temporarily is going to make me feel better. And it, it, uh, it is an, an addict. It is like someone having a hit of cocaine. But the, the trouble with it is, it hey, dissipates. Let's leave the women out of this, okay? <laughs> uh, because uh, there aren't, there are not a lot of men who say, you know, I feel really bad. I think I'll go buy something. Oh no. But there, there, there are men who do. I mean, remember the bumper sticker was on generally a big truck <laughs> with he had a four wheeler in the back of it and gun racks hanging out the sides, <clears throat> and uh, yeah. And it's real easy for us to condemn other people when they buy something that maybe we don't have. Right. And and then it, well, yeah, you don't need that. Nah. Why in the world did they do that? Why in the world did they build a house that cost twenty thousand dollars? That's ridiculous. Yeah. I'm quoting from people a long, long time ago. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. As a contractor, you would understand that. Well, uh, not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. That's right. Some <clears throat> sometimes it's really difficult to hand somebody something, especially if what you have in your hand is valued to you. But we got to learn to hand stuff to people. We got to learn to say, we got to quit. My joy on. and my pride is not in having a bunch of stuff. Yeah, we got to be able to let go. Um, sort of like the little kid who's told to share half his candy bar with someone, <clears throat> and 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 the minute you tell him to hold to share not to share it, his tip his grip becomes so tight that the 
chocolate bar begins to spread <laughs> out of his hand. And I'm not letting this go. Uh, and I'm the same way, not with a candy bar, but you know, I am the same way. I mean, there are things that <coughs> if I was asked to give up, it'd be a struggle. There are a lot of things, a lot of passages in the New Testament that teach us how to do that. How to how it is more blessed to give mm -hmm. to other people than mm -hmm. to receive. And there's a great value in knowing that you've helped somebody when they couldn't help themselves. Exactly. Um, I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said, the tallest a man is is when he stoops down to help a child. Yep. When you help somebody who really needs that kind of assistance, you can get addicted to that just like you can get addicted you can. to the other. You can. Uh, well, let's go on down. To, uh, Jesus has done everything he can to introduce this parable. And then we get to the parable and we got the rich man. And I, I like how this is the ground of a certain rich man. He's already rich. Okay. It would be like comparing, okay, uh, the guy who owns, who has four million, his one of his stocks just split five ways. Now he's worth 50 billion. Okay, that's what this story is. And all of a sudden now, okay, I'm just not investing in a bank. I'm going to go buy my own bank. I'm going to have my own bank. And I'm going to make sure I've got plenty for the rest, for everything. I'll tell you some things that make me want to spit fire when... Uh, a few years ago, and this happened to four or five different guys that played for the Cleveland Indians. Mm -hmm. You know, they got upset because they're only making $10 million a year <laughs> or $15 million a year. So they go someplace else or they get traded so they can make another million a year. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, where, where's your sense of loyalty? Yeah. Now, I'm, sh I'm sure there are human beings that went back and forth and had they had their differences. But a lot of them just go someplace else so they can have two more, two million dollars more. And I'm going, well, Jesus said your life does not consist of what you possess. These people, those people who do that are, are saying, my life does consist of what I possess. And I got to possess more. I got to get more. And that will make me happy. Well, you know, the thing is, though, Steve, part of the importance of this story is, is actually a twofold point. One is the point you've already made to us, the that life does not consist of a abundance of abundance. possessions. But it also, life is not found, uh, life is found in the d distribution of others because inevitably, that is Jesus' point, though he doesn't come right out and say it, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years, take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to them, this you fool, this very, very night your life will be man demanded of you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? In other words, either you can give it away, or I can. Mm -hmm. One of the two. Uh, you know, and th that's Jesus' point. This is, the, this is what will happen for those who all they do with their stuff is store it up, is keep it. This is why I say it comes back to that talent thing. Because they were given uh, a certain uh, treasures and they were to use them wisely. If you look at the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2, there were a lot of people who had all kinds they of sold. stuff because they lived there. And then there were visitors who had come there who decided they wanted to stay for another week or another two weeks, they had to be fed, they had to be taken care of, and they and they were taken care of because of the Christians who who said, this Here. is not my stuff, this is our stuff. Yeah, and we, we, need to, we, need a, we need to have a garage sale here, and we're going to sell some stuff and so that we can uh, use it to help because we got too much going on here. And I think we as human beings very easily see the idea where, okay, I got this much stuff over here, and this guy doesn't have very much stuff at all. 
and I have within me a desire to make those scales balanced a little bit more than they were before I got a, became a part of this scenario. Kind of reminds me of the story of a couple who noticed a man who lived in a shack, but it was a, I mean, it was weather tight, it had heat, he, he was able to have water, but they noticed he only had one pair of shoes, and they thought, you know what, let's, let's get him some sh extra shoes. So they go by one night and at his front door drop a new pair of shoes off. And they run into him a few days later, and they expected to see him in the new pair of shoes. And he, they asked him, says, didn't you get, didn't someone drop you off a new pair of shoes? He goes, yes. I thought that was so nice of somebody to give me something so I could give it away to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, because he said, I got one pair of shoes, and I like these. Everything in this world, every possession, None of us have anything. They are all gifts. They're, nobody, they're, they're all gifts that come from God. And if you have those, there was, a, there was another story about the guy who kept trying to tell his wife that uh, God owed everything. You know, their kids, their house, their cars, their kitchen appliances, God owned everything. She called him one day and she was crying. He said, what's the matter? And she said, I just wrecked God's car. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that was a good lesson for him to find it out. It was. Just because, okay, if it was God's car, are you upset that mm -mm. she wrecked God's car? Well, no, he, she sh he shouldn't have been because they make new, new models of those things all the time. They're, they're, they're we, like... We just can't grab a hold of things like that and hold them and say... I can't share this with anybody. Um, of all the things that I really truly believe that if we as a, as a body of believers lived this element of our walk, our journey with Jesus Christ, I think we would have an explosion of people who would want to say, hey, I want to be with be with those people. Yeah. yeah. And the sad part about it is we're probably, as believers, sometimes, often times, the most wealthy version of this country. And most of us also feel a sense of responsibility that when we share our stuff, our junk, our possessions with other people, that they're going to use them properly too. We do. We do. I mean, as you know, we have many who come to our building and we give. Uh, we don't give without uh, wisdom I, I, that I feel that, that is necessary because if you're going to go buy it to just use in a way that uh, for drugs or alcohol or whatever, I'm, I'm going to have to probably not going to help you. But if you're looking for help to make a do go down a different path in your life, we're we're here, but it, it's still yet. Sometimes they may ask for something that I'm really holding on to, though, too. When you at our, our introductions, when you always tell our audience how many years I've preached here, and I have preached in the Canal Valley for 50 years, so I have a little bit of experience in this. People coming to the church who want something, and the times that they have, you know, I could tell somebody was on drugs or somebody was on alcohol, and they want some money, you know, to go buy a bus ticket or to, you know, go see their grandmother or something like that. And, and then you start thinking about, after I give somebody some money, it's not my responsibility anymore to follow him around. Matter of fact, I'd almost say to a person, look, I'm going to give you some money. If you're going to go buy beer with it, then tell me the truth and I'll give you some money. But don't stand there and lie to me and tell me you're going to use it for something else and then go buy drugs or alcohol. I remember a guy that one time uh, held up a sign and said, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm buying, I'm getting this money for beer. 
There's an honest man. Honest man. Yeah. But you know, but at the same time, I mean, I, I know we're called to be stewards, and uh, there were many times, um, you know, Jesus. Okay, he didn't give this man what he asked for. So oh. there is wisdom required, but at the same time, uh, the balancing act that we as that we're called to be in is to never be in a place where <clears throat> our heart tells us this person needs it, but yet I'm, I'm going to hold on to it. And this guy mentally has this idea in his brain. The more I have, the happier I will be. So I'm going to have to tear down my barns and build some more barns. I, I, when I read this, I can never figure out, well, just leave your old barns up and, uh, and add on. But he, he, he wants everything brand new. So he tears down the old ones and he's going to build the, build the larger ones. And I will say to him, I love this, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Wow, talk about a false sense of security. Man, you, you, can, you look at how much stuff you got. You can just sit down and never go to work in your life, never make any more money. You're, you're just set for the rest of your life. You're done. And do you know sit what? Sit back. Do you know what God called him? Fool. A fool. You fool. Okay, I go from, I want all this stuff to be mine, I want all this stuff to be my possessions, and the more possessions I have, the happier I'm going to be, to God saying, you're a moron. You're a fool. You're an absolute fool if you think that's the way life is, because that's not the way life is at all. This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you prepared? Somebody else is going to get all that stuff that you were planning on using the rest of your life. Yep, and and that's the bottom line. What are you doing with the treasures that God has given you? You know, one of the two most popular topics that Jesus talks about throughout all of his preaching and teaching are money and hell. <laughs> Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. And <coughs> and it seems that if you're holding on to the one, you're going to get the other. <coughs> you know? <laughs> because uh, we're, we're called to be gracious and merciful and loving as our Father in Heaven is and as Jesus Christ was in, in His life that He lived here. And as we know, Jesus never owned a thing. Nope. Never owned a thing. Had to. Never had his own. Well, as unless he. I guess the only thing child. he had was sandals and a cloak. You know. <clears throat> he. Uh, he didn't carry much around with him. Matter of fact, he told the apostles not. They weren't supposed to carry much with him either. And he didn't even. He never knew how much. What was <coughs> Judas had the treasury and. Yeah. And uh, as a, I heard one preacher say, he. he he owns a little, he even had to borrow a grave. He was putting a borrowed grave. So, uh, so what's the moral of this story? The moral is God's going to call you a fool if, if you <laughs> act this way. And that my soul is going to be required if I act like a fool. And now, who will own what you have prepared? So the man who lays up treasure for himself is not rich towards God. You can't do both. Can't do both. Son, you can't do both. You can't you can't pile it up and get bigger pile, bigger pile, more stuff, more junk, more things, more possessions that's gonna make me happy. You can't do that. And understand your real treasures that comes from obeying God and helping his people make makes it a little more common. You know, we we level, level the playing field. We level that off a little bit more by me sharing with you and giving you something that you really need. Like the guy you said borrowed, had the shoes. Okay, I got 12 pair of shoes over here in my closet and there's a guy who doesn't own a pair of shoes but I'm not going to give it to him. Yeah. He said, if that's what you're going to do, your soul's going to be required of you. You're a fool. Yep. Yeah. We, def we definitely need to uh, uh, reevaluate 
our own economy and how we perceive the value of things and turn this thing upside down in our lives. Exactly too. right. And to reinvent, not to reinvent, but to relook at the word that's in verse 21, rich towards God. Rich towards God. You can be rich towards Him or you can just say... And the only way we can be rich towards God is to give to His creation. Mm -hmm. Because God doesn't need any of our stuff. Doesn't need one thing. But He also wants us to not to value it so much because He gave it to us anyway. So, Well, that will be, I guess, our week this week. Uh, I hope the par I'm really enjoying our parable stories. I really am. Uh, they've been a lot of fun. And you can never go wrong quoting Jesus. So <laughs> <laughs> No. I I'm ashamed to no, I'm not embarrassed. I hope you don't misunderstand me when I say I quote Jesus more than I quote you. Oh yeah. Is that okay? You, uh you'd be a fool if you I'd be a fool. <laughs> you fool. <laughs> well, on, on behalf of Steve and I, we are so glad that you tuned in and joined us this week. We look forward to being again with you next week. And if you have any questions, any comments, please, please don't hesitate to let us know. And as always, we look forward to seeing you again on behalf of Steve and I. We'll see you next week. Have a great day. <laughs>